again, because now we're in Philippians 4, which is where we started this whole journey on this series called Philippians, right? We, we started talking about this whole idea of joy and rejoicing. Hello, phone. <laughs> oh, it's on the chair. Okay. I'll wait, I'll wait 30 seconds. Nobody's going to listen to me until, I, you know, we're, we're, done. we're done answering the phone. Is that you, Tyler? All right, you just turn it off. All right. It's time for Tim to preach. That's what it's saying. All right. You all ready? <laughs> all right. Everybody say the word rejoice. Everybody? Rejoice. Right? That's what we're talking about. Joy. That's, that's what we're in this whole book of Philippians. And, uh, and you guys remember that last week we talked about making our life count, right? That we want our life to count. So let's all say this together. I want my life to count, right? And we talked about counting things and how Paul took account of his life and, and then ended with, you no, know, we got to count for the kingdom. That's what we want to experience. And, and so if you missed last week, go ahead, go, go online, watch that, go on our app, on our YouTube channel, um, get caught up. Because last week, honestly, if, if you're kind of like wondering what you're supposed to do or you're wrestling with some things in your life, that kind of stuff, last week's sermon, I think, is one of those good kind of defining make you think, okay, I need to realign some stuff in my life type of sermon, okay? Um, and so go back to that one. But with this whole series, we have one main point, and we're, we're getting close to the end, guys. Can you believe it? Okay, some of you are like, I was hoping for the end, Tim. I Maybe. I don't know. But like, it, like we're in week seven. We've gone through this for seven weeks, and, and still we're walking through the same idea that joy, what we want to experience in our life is true joy, it's not the absence of trouble, but it's the presence of Jesus. Everybody, let's say that together again. We're going to remind ourselves. Joy is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of Jesus. This is what the Apostle Paul is teaching us through the book of Philippians. That's what he was telling the church in Philippi. Hey, um, rejoice, even if circumstances aren't going your way. Even if you have a life of the unknown, and you don't know what the next step, next day, what anything is going to look like, you can rejoice. And we know Paul, that's where he was. He was in prison. He was chained to a, a guard. Um, he didn't know the sentence of his life in this moment as he's writing this letter. Was it going to be, they're going to let him free, and he can, like, okay, now go keep preaching the gospel, or are they going to kill him? And for him, he said, Jesus, either way. Either I'm preaching Jesus, or I'm with Jesus. It's all about Jesus, so I can rejoice, because I have the presence of Jesus. And that's, that's what we're learning. Now, the sermon we're about to dig into right now, I just need you to know, I've been preaching at myself. You know those sermons, like, I need you guys to understand something. Your pastor's not perfect. Oh, shocker, my sister-in-law right there. She knows it pretty well, uh, right? Like, like, I'm not perfect, and this week was not a perfect week for me, just even emotionally. I'm like, man, why am I going through this or this, and why am I wrestling with this? And then I get finally back to Saturday, and I look back over my sermon. I finish it on Wednesday. I come back on Saturday just to be like, all right, what are we doing? And I'm reading the passage, and I start laughing. I'm like, okay, Jesus, I see what you were doing all week long to set me up to preach this. So as I'm preaching this morning, I'm pointing at you and me, all right? We're all in this together as we talk about this. Now, do you know anybody in your life um, who is a worst-case scenario person? You know those people that, like, no matter what the circumstances, their mind always goes to the absolute worst-case scenario? Yeah, okay, no elbows, okay? I'm just, no, none of this. I'm just, because a lot of us may know somebody, maybe one person, we may even live with somebody, that one person, who their mind just goes places, and they may start thinking like this at the dinner table. I want you to watch this video, because I think it's brilliant, because some of you do this. Watch it. How was work? Nothing unusual. Email was down again, and uh, Bill called me into his office again. What's wrong? Nothing, really. He just thinks he can come down and fit in with these blue-collar guys. You know, he's white-collar. And he's in or you've done something wrong again, and you're getting in trouble, and you'll get demoted, then you'll stop shaving, there goes my vacation, maybe you'll even get fired, and then you'll do that lazy thing and I'll have to go back to work, and there goes the house. We had plans for this house. We'll be living out of our car or out of the street, and eventually we'll be forced to move in with your mother. How was your day, Kim? Well... Dana's having a party Friday night, and I thought I could go. But before you freak out, it's not going to be that big of a deal. I mean, y'all guys know me. You're a great kid, but there's no stopping the peer pressure. It just takes one sip, and you're hooked. And then there's the smoking, and the piercings, and the tattoos, and the boys. 
Even good boys don't have good intentions, never mind the bad boys. Oh, and you'll go straight for one of the bad boys, and they'll introduce you to all the bad things, and you'll get pregnant, and drop out of school, and we'll never see you again. And we'll be stuck with your kid. What about you, Mom? I've been considering taking up string art. No. Des has been doing some really wonderful things with it. You can do anything with string. Did you know you can make refrigerator magnets? Everyone knows string art is a gateway craft. You'll start knitting and making me hats and scarves and sweaters and making me wear those sweaters. And you'll stop dyeing your hair and get those grandma glasses and you'll want a cat, which will kill my allergies and probably lead to more cats. And you'll want to make things and bring it to my class and embarrass me in front of all of my friends. Does anybody know anybody like that? You ever do that while you're sitting at the table, you hear one thing, and you're like, and your mind just goes, right? It's like worst case scenario, like the world's going to end. You know, some people are, are, you know, your mind just goes that direction towards the bad things, right? And, and, um, and so often, and we know actually in America, anxiety is a huge issue. It's really an epidemic of, of people walking around and living with high anxiety, stress, uh, worry, all those kind of things, and, and so they medicate, you know, to, ex- to b- have a little bit of a, okay, I can survive my day, and those kind of things, and, um, and I'm not saying there's anything necessarily wrong with medication, but I think w- when we are talking about this whole thing of worst case scenario, or worry, or anxiety, that God's Word has something to say about that for us, and for you, and for me, and the way we think, you know, the way we let our thought processes play out in circumstances, we have a tendency to want to know what's next, Right? It's just natural humanity. Like, we want to know what's next. And the reality is, we don't always know what's next. Um, and nor can we control what's next, because we can't control our search circumstances all the time, and we can't control other people. Did you know you can't do that? Some of you try really hard. I'm just letting you know, they're, they're dying inside because of it, right? You, you're strangling people because of control. All of these things, when we look at this passage in Philippians 4, We see Paul giving us an answer. We see God's word giving us a solution to not be that worst case scenario type of person or letting anxieties or worries affect our hearts, our minds, the way we think and and, and the way we act and respond to relationships. There's something better. Isn't that good? There's something better. There's something that we can get out of the truth here of what God wants for us. So we're going to dig right in. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, bust out your Bibles if you already haven't. Um, open with me to Philippians 4. We're going to be reading 4 through 9. This section that we're in is verses 1 through 9, though, okay? And I always say every week, bring your Bibles, right? Okay? And if you don't have one, if you're here and you're kind of like, oops, I forgot, that's okay. Um, you can download an app on your phone in like 30 seconds called the Bible app, or you can grab some Bibles uh, on the uh, table on the other side of the wall there. Um, we're going to be digging into uh, Philippians 4. Verses 4 through 9, I'm just going to read it first, all the way through, and then we're going to go through and learn and grow and and be challenged. Okay, is everybody with me? Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Who loves that last sentence? And the God of peace will be with you. Who, just show of hands, yeah. Anybody want that? Like, yes, I want the God of peace to be with me. We want that, and he told us how to get that. Did you, did you hear it? That's what we're going to learn today. How do we get that? How do we experience the God of peace with us, with with me, with you? Okay, everybody with me? Here we go. We're going to start right at the very beginning, and we're going to talk about two things and then three things. And you're like, what does that mean? All right, the first one is two, and then we're going to unpack three. The 
first thing is this. If you want to be free from worry, you have to first walk in God's presence. God's presence. If you want, that's the beginning. That's what he says in this passage. The very first step that we need to experience, and we even sang as we worship this morning, that was kind of the heartbeat here. We want to experience God's presence in our circumstances, in our life, in our daily movement. We, we want him with us as Christ followers, right? And, and in this very first passage, in verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it, just rejoice, right? He's like, he's, he's pleading, exclamation point, like, hey, rejoice, you know? It, it, let your gentleness be evident to all. And then this, the Lord is near. Th- this is a good word right here at the very beginning of this passage. The Lord is where? Near. Near. And when he's saying this, he's not saying the Lord is near. And this is not like an end times prophecy scripture. That's not what we're reading. It's not like the Lord is near. Repent. You know, it's not one of those, you know, kind of things like, like Jesus coming back right now. That, I mean, th- that's true. He could come anytime he wants to. Like he could come right now if he wanted to. That'd be pretty cool while we're worshiping. Wouldn't it be cool if Jesus showed up and like actually like that was his return time? It probably won't be. We'll probably be in the bathroom and it'll be in a, just like, oh, Jesus, oh, come on. You know, like, you know, who knows? But anytime he can show up. It's on his calendar. God knows when he's going to return, right? And that's a great promise for us who are in Christ Jesus, that he is returning. And he's going to complete what he has promised. But this passage, he's saying the Lord is near, as in he is here. He's not far. He's not distant. His presence is with us. That's the promise of the Christ follower, that the Holy Spirit indwells inside of you. That's the presence of God near, right? And for us, we, that's the foundation, the very first thing. I'm not going to go super deep into that. I, I think y'all are understanding. The very first thing, if for us to not live a, a life of worry, of, of worst case scenario, we need to first realize and accept and speak into our own soul, God's near. He's near. The nearness and the presence of God changes things. Right? All right. That's it for that one. You good? second thing to be free from worry we have to walk in god's presence and we have to walk in god's peace you can write that down walk in god's peace and this is where we're hanging out today this is the the next three we're going to talk through how to walk into god's peace we all said we want it we want the god of peace to be with us we want god's peace in us we we want to experience it no matter what with the circumstance we can say rejoice like how how do we get that How do we walk into that? So the first one we need, say these with me, is God's presence. The next one is God's peace, okay? This morning is a teaching. I'm teaching you guys, okay? Sometimes it's like I get preachy. Sometimes I'm like, you know, very inspirational. Today, we're just getting down to brass tacks. This is how you do this, all right? That's how you live it. Ready? All right, this this section. You guys ready over here? All right, over here? Over here? I still, over here? You ready? How about you guys? Yeah. All, right, all right, cool, cool. All right, just want to be sure. Here we go. This is how we do this, okay? How, how do we experience God's peace? We want it, and Paul tells us, God's word shares us, experiencing God's peace first through right praying. Right praying. Write that down. Number one, right praying. That's what he talks about in the very f- next part of this passage. You know? A, God is present. He's with us. He is near. Now, we want his peace, and we want to first understand how to pray how to pray now let's dig into the passage where we learn this verse six do not be anxious about anything what are we supposed to be anxious about nothing that's what he said and and it's not a you know if you if you do your best and try to like not be anxious about like that's not what he's saying like this is almost command like right do not be anxious about anything don't do it don't Don't do it. All right, I'm going to pray and we're going to leave. All right, here we go. Do you know what the word anxious means? Like in this passage, um, there's there's kind of two languages here. Because anxious in the Greek, um, it it means to be troubled uh, with cares. Like it's it's being troubled inside with with cares that overwhelm. You know, has anybody ever experienced that this week? I I think it's interesting. The uh, English word anxious 
comes from uh, the Anglo-Saxon word that means to strangle. Have you ever been strangled with anxiety? That's what it does. It strangles out life. It steals life. It steals relationships. It steals momentum. It steals joy. It steals hope. It, it is a stealer of God's presence in our life when we let it be the ruler and reign in our hearts, right? And so we're being told, don't be anxious. Don't be overwhelmed by the cares of this world. Don't let the cares and woes strangle out the life God has for you. That's a powerful image. I've experienced that in real, real ways. I've allowed anxiety and anxiousness to rule my heart at times where I'm like, don't do that. You know, like, it's, it's, it's defeating. And this morning, if you're there, maybe you're in that spot, I, I want to give you hope that God has a way out for you. And it's usually not by yourself, okay? It usually requires some help. It usually requires some other people walking alongside of you, speaking truth into the lies that you are playing out in your head. So I would encourage you, if, if you're there, A, listen to the rest of the sermon, don't zone out, and then B, by the end, I, I want to really encourage you, find some help. Somebody to walk through putting off the lies that you're experiencing that create anxiety that just raise up and strangle out your life and walk into the truth that God has because truth will always set you free. That's, that's Jesus' promise. And he promises he's the truth and he will set you free. So Paul's encouragement, don't be anxious. Instead, put on right praying, right praying. He says, but no, 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 do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. How many situations? Every. every. He's like, well, good, bad, whatever. Like every situation. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And that's right praying. It's saying no matter what, whether I'm great or whether I'm bad, whether I'm woohoo or I'm, you know, whatever I'm in, like that, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to lift that up to him. I'm going to petition him. Petitioning is like going door to door to door, you know, like trying to get a bunch of people to sign up. Like, hey, are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? Like petitioning God is that same thing. God, here it is again. Here it is again. Here's this thing, God. Here, it's continually going before God. Even at times you feel like, is he hearing me? And he is hearing you. He may have to work out a bunch of other things for you to experience what you need to in the answer, but he hears you. So petition with thanksgiving. That's, that's a hard thing to pray. God, I'm going through this hard time, but I'm thankful to you, God, because I know you hear me. I'm thankful that you will answer me. It's speaking truth in your own soul when you pray to the God who loves you. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's not a one and done. You don't buy your lottery ticket of prayer and hope it works. You know, it's not how it works. It's a relationship with God. Continually bring it forward. And here, you ready for the promise part of this one? Yeah, nod your head if you are. All right. When you don't walk with anxiety or being anxious about letting things strangle and instead you continually bring it to God, this is what he says. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a really cool picture right here, right? The peace of God, everybody say that with me, the peace of God, that's what we all want, which transcends all understanding. I mean, it, it's, it's those moments where my life is crazy, but I have peace. That doesn't make sense. That's what he's talking about here. It's like circumstances don't align with me being full of joy and having peace. And yet the God of peace is with me. So I experience joy and peace because God is with me. And it goes beyond our own understanding. He says that peace that goes beyond our understanding will guard your hearts. This, you live your life out of your heart, right? That's kind of your innermost being part of you. And your minds, the way you think, what you think, how you think in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is all over this. You got God, you got Jesus, Holy Spirit, boom, the Trinity is happening. You got three for one, y'all. That's a pretty awesome gift, right? I love this imagery of guard, of guarding. 
peace of God will guard your heart. It'll guard your mind. It's, this, it's, it's a war term. To guard is to set up a front of protection, a wall of defense, fully armed, that nothing can penetrate. That's that picture there, that the peace of God can guard. It can set up a front. It can, whatever the enemy wants to shoot, the arrows he wants to fly at you, the circumstances that he wants. To, no, 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 I'm sorry. I have prayed to my God, who I have given thanks to for the answer I know he will bring in his own timing. And I'm resting on the understanding of him, not my circumstance. And I'm letting him be the guard of my heart and my mind. The way I think about this circumstance and what I feel in my inmost being about what is happening right now. That's good. That's good. To guard. I, I love this definition. This is actually from the Greek. The word guard means to guard, protect by a military guard, either to prevent hostile invasion or to keep inhabitants of a besieged city from flight. It's both and. It's holding what needs to be held in, guarded, and what needs to be held out is held out, guarded. The peace of God, which transcends what we can make sense of. And that's what we want. Number one, to experience God's peace, we need right praying. Okay? Everybody say that with me. Right praying. Okay? Number two that we need to experience is right thinking. Okay? First, he challenges pray this way. And here's what God will do. Pray this way. This is what God will do. That's, those are promises in God's word. Experience God's peace through now. Right thinking. Right thinking. Um, let's just look at the passage. Here we go. To verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, which I think is funny, he says finally, because then he keeps going on and on and on and on. It's just like a pastor to do that, right? A preacher. Finally, and then 17 minutes later. So no, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, do what? Think about such things. Right thinking is what he's talking about. You have to have right thinking to experience the presence of God in your mind, right? Um, has anybody ever experienced stinking thinking? Show of hands. All right, right? That's where, like, things aren't the way they should be in your brain, and you're thinking things that are lies, those lies then become exaggerated to the worst case scenarios. And then they start to assume things about what other people are thinking, what other people are saying about the circumstance or about you, and, and those things grow, right? That's all stinking thinking, because what we end up doing is start thinking about the bad, we start thinking about the evil, we start thinking about those things, and then that becomes the thing that actually creates the anxiety. Now we're anxious about it because we're thinking about it, and boom, it just grows and explodes, Right? That's called stinking thinking. I'm guilty of it. I think all of us are, really. Because this is what stinking thinking is. This is not Philippians 4 8, all right? Because this is what we do, though. This is what we do. We think about whatever is a lie, whatever is immoral, whatever is wrong, whatever is impure, whatever is ugly, whatever is unworthy, if anything is bad or dishonorable. Think about these things. That's the complete opposite if you didn't notice that. But this is what a lot of times we end up doing. We start thinking about the more. We start thinking about the things that are wrong in the circumstance. Or we start thinking about the, the other people and what they've done that's ugly or unworthy or dishonorable. And, and we allow the stinking thinking to just grow. It takes root. Boom. It goes from our minds to our hearts. It becomes a deep belief that then we operate out of. And, uh, and it's dangerous, right? <clears throat> it's really dangerous. Because it doesn't lead us to freedom or truth. He tells us, God tells us, we need, if we want the peace of God, to change our minds. To change our minds. The way we think. We need to have right prayer and we have to right, have right thinking. Think about the right things. Think about the things that we're supposed to. I love the way it's put in Colossians. Paul said this, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. All those descriptors, whatever, lovely, pure, you know, all, all those things, um, admirable, uh, true, excellent, praiseworthy. Do you know what all that describes? God's word. 
God's word is all the above, right? God's word is truth, it's right, it's noble, it's pure, it's lovely, it's admirable, it's excellent, it's praiseworthy. And just a practical step here for us to put off stinking thinking, we just need to get good thinking, and good thinking is all over the scriptures. I mean, when you get into the Bible, you're not getting stinking thinking, you're getting truth. And so if you are going through that pattern, I would encourage you to go back and just say, no, I'm going to I'm going to read God's word. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get into it. I'm going to allow myself to not set my minds on, on earthly things, on, on the circumstance, on the junk, and all the things. I'm going to set my minds on things above. That means eternal things. And God's word is a really practical way to do that. Just start reading. Start reading the scriptures. Get into it. Find truth. And this is, again, where I say it's really helpful if you do that with somebody else. All right? It's extremely helpful and beneficial when you have somebody beside you now saying, what are we reading together? And they can encourage you, you can encourage them. That's when like life transformation actually starts happening. Because there's things you're not going to understand. There's things they're not going to understand. There's, there's things that the Holy Spirit does when you get in a circle with other people to bring out even more truth to impact your heart and your life. Okay. Is everybody with me? Okay. Right prayer, right thinking. And then he, he wraps it up with this. Okay. He says, and also now with right living, okay? Experience God's peace through right praying, right thinking, and right living, right living, okay? Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is what he says. So whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, he's, Paul's using himself as an example. He's like, guys, you've been watching me. You've been watching what I do. You've been watching me as I watch God or Christ, and I'm trying to live for Christ. And then he says this, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace. You guys remember that? What do we want? That. We want the God of peace to be with us. He says, this is the last thing, right living. So what you've learned, what you've seen, what you've received, put it into practice. Do it. <laughs> right? As, as, you know, the famous shoe company would say, just do it. Right? Like, what are you waiting for? You've, you've learned something, now do it. Like, live it out. Make it real. I was thinking about this whole thing, put it into practice. Um, do we have any athletes in the house? Some people that maybe you run or you uh, do track, maybe you play a sport. Um, you think about Olympic athletes. We're, we're moving on, you know, to this year, the Winter Olympics are coming up. And you have these, like, skiers, and you have... Uh, these snowboarders, and you've got these, these people, the, the figure skating, right? <clears throat> All these people have a coach in their life that help them every single day to do it, what they're supposed to be doing, right? And, and, uh, and the coach comes, they do their practice, and the, it's the coach's job to say, no, do it this way, do this better, here's to try this, and he, they, the coach gives that athlete, here's the exact things you need to do, to get better or improve or to fix that one thing you've been trying to do over and over. Try this. Now do this. Right? That's what a coach does. And so you see these athletes who are just, you're like, how did they just, how does their body move like that? I don't even understand, right? Like the physics behind what just happened and how they did that. I tell you, it happened because they had some amazing coaches telling them and teaching them and training them to do what they needed to do to make that happen, right? Now, what if a coach came in and they saw somebody continue to do the same thing over and over and over and over again, and the coach is like, I'm telling you, if you just do this, It'll change everything. And like, okay, and but they never do it. Would you call that a good athlete or a bad athlete? Okay, that's a mixed response. I would call that a bad athlete, right? Or a prideful one, one or the other. They think they know best. But they're not going to win gold. Right? They're not going to be the most successful. You see, for us as Christians, I'm going to kind of correlate this. As Christians, we grow and change when we learn God's truth. God's truth gets exposed to our heart. We learn something new, and then our role is to be coached by the Holy Spirit in our life and to put it into practice, to start doing it, right? So whenever you live a life and you think, man, why does this keep happening in relationships with me over and over and over again, over and over and over again, and, you, and all you do is point at everybody else, it's everybody else's fault, you may want to let the Holy Spirit coach you a little bit and say, you may be doing something wrong that's not in alignment with God's truth. You want God's promises, but you're not walking in His truth, so you can't actually experience a promise when you walk outside of it. The Holy Spirit may be coaching you, okay, you 
tried it your way now try it this way get into god's word and see what he says about it what whatever that circumstance is i don't know what it is you know what it might be for you but when you start to put it into practice is when you get to be the beneficiary of god's promise in that circumstance in your life god's promises are attached to obedience to his word they always are and so here paul is pray rightly you know having right prayer um start thinking in a right way not all the bad not all the negative not all, don't be a pessimist i think a, i think a christian pessimist is a oxymoron and it shouldn't exist right it can't um and now he's saying now now put it into practice you have to have right living to have the peace of god in your life continually putting off the old self which is you sin nature pride whatever it might be continually learning and putting on the new self which is based upon new truth after new truth after new truth it's a process of growth god isn't demanding perfection now you need to understand that that's called legalism and we never attain to that he's he's asking for obedience to what you've already attained what do you already know and are you walking into it all right cool now i'm going to give you a new truth now put it into practice pray to me be in my presence awesome now i'm going to give you a new truth that's that's the journey of growth with god in a relationship with him i love this quote by warren wearsby he says it is not enough to use the bible as a basis just for praying and claiming its promises we must also use it as a basis for our living obeying its precepts that's what we're supposed to do as christ followers Right praying, right thinking, right living. Can you guys say those three things with me? First one, right praying, right thinking, right living, okay? And then the God of peace will be with you. That's what we want. That's what we want. God, thank you for this word this morning, for the encouragement and challenge in it for us as Christians. That, that your desire is to be near and you are near. That you're not far away. You're not some distant God that's floating out in the universe. We're grateful that you are near and you are here and that you desire these things for us. I mean, you desire for us to walk in your peace. You've given us everything we need to do it. You desire for us to walk out of being anxious and you've given us everything we need to do that. You've You've even put people in our lives, God, whether we've seen it or not, or whether we rejected it, or I, I pray, God, that we would know who you've put in our lives to help us grow in these things. God, I want to pray for anybody in this room who's been struggling with anxiety on a regular basis. God, I know what it feels like. You know that. You know my journey, God, and it is hard. It's hard. And I pray that you would, right now, even Holy Spirit, work in their hearts to begin to release the lies that are holding their minds captive to things that aren't of you. I pray you do that, God. We can't. I just pray you would do it free them and to help them God to walk into the things you want them to to experience the freedom as well I just have a few questions as I always do at the end of my messages for you to think to process you know the truth that, that you just heard and this is the first one if we want the peace of God we need to ask ourselves this what specific thoughts strangle the peace of God in your life regularly? Are they thoughts about a person or a situation or a thing? Like what, what, just name it. Name that specific thing that strangles, right? Makes you anxious. Because in naming it, what you're doing is actually making the enemy tremble in it because it's the first process of finding truth, okay? So what is it? Number two, what is one thing, 
that you need to change this week to put on right praying, right thinking, and right living? What's one thing that you can do this week to start living that out? We're going to sing a song in just a moment that that proclaims, you know, for those of us who are Christians, it proclaims the promises we believe in and we trust. And that God's promises are higher than and are farther above than our emotions or our reality. He sees them from a different altitude. And uh, and we want to proclaim that in our own lives, that we know that we have a God that sees it differently than we do. And that his promises are attached to the things that we can't even see. So we're going to sing that in a moment, but th- this morning, if there's somebody here, you don't have a relationship with Jesus this morning, and that may be a part of your anxiety. <laughs> it may be a part because you don't know. There's things you just don't know, and yet you need to know that there's a God who absolutely, totally, 100%, right where you're at today, loves you. No matter how bad, no matter how bad you feel you are, or how unworthy you think you are, or no matter what, God loves you, and I don't know who needs to hear that but if it's you listen okay the only place you can find true peace is in God alone it isn't in another relationship with somebody else it isn't drinking down a bottle on a regular basis it isn't looking at things and finding really neat answers on Facebook it isn't in any of those other distractions it's in God alone and if you need to start that relationship with that God right now, I'm going to allow you, I'm going to invite you, I'm going to say God wants you to walk into that relationship. And all you have to do is confess it to him. and Say, God, I need you in my life. I need you as my Lord and Savior. And if you want to do that right now, I'm going to pray. You pray these words to yourself. This is a private time, guys. I would just, everybody just bow your heads and and and, and I want us to be praying and maybe you know somebody who is living in in anxiety or somebody who needs Christ right now I pray as Christians you would pray for that person right now that they would find hope in Christ but if you want to take that step of faith right now and say I know I need God I need you to know Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins so that you don't have to that's the consequence of sin is death but Jesus died for you and then he conquered death by raising from the dead three days later And now he has the power of death and life. You know, in scripture, it says, if you call on his name and and confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. Invite him right now, and you can pray this. In your own words, this isn't like magic, Pastor Tim said, and boom, I'm in. It's your word, your heart, your mind, saying this to God. You can say, God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm lost without you. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross in my place and paid for my sin. And I believe Jesus is your son. I invite him into my heart and into my life. I give you my life now and forever. Thank you for adopting me into your family. And I proclaim you as my heavenly father. And I just confess this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I tell you what, if you just prayed that, you just took a step. (laughs) You just took a step to the God of peace. And I pray that you will now start running to him. Because when you turn to him, he sprints at you and loves you like crazy. Church, let's stand together. We're going to sing of those promises. And I want you to just continually let God work in your heart in these things that we talked about to experience the peace of God. You, we need to walk into his presence. We need to have right prayer, right thinking, right living. And we're going to proclaim that his promises are true right now. That no matter what we feel, no matter what we think, no matter what we experience, we know that God's word is true and that we can experience that. So God, continue to lead us as we just take a moment to respond, let you continue to speak into us, Holy Spirit, and lead us in this.